So it's my pleasure to introduce Brian Murray from HDR. Today, Brian has been with us at HDR for two years now. One about one and a half. One and a half. So yeah, I'm always exaggerating a bit for so one and a half. Um, and uh, he's been starting his works on including atomics, atomic physics in particle in cells. So these are two two things. First of all, particle in cell, which unfortunately we haven't yet had an introduction to. That's a very specific technique to simulate plasmas at, at very high energies. And it's a particle-based technique. So in principle, these because it's called particle in cell, it's just a numerical description. Included an introduction. Wonderful, but repetition is always good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, one, one of the fundamental things that Brian is working on and that, that is very new in this field is usually what people do here is they compute the plasma and from the properties of the plasma they compute the atomic physics and that's it there is no interaction so you just get general information about the plasma and then you say what do the atoms look like why is this interesting the fundamental reason is because the atomic physics first interacts with a plasma, so on the fundamental scale, but also the atomic physics can help you in understanding the properties of the plasma. They can, for example, there can be radiation effects and so on that tell you something on the properties of the plasma. Astroplasma physics is one of these fundamental things because we can't travel to the stars, we can't travel to galaxies, so a lot of the information we actually get is on atomic physics happening there, that you see a certain spectral line popping up, helium. Helium is a wonderful thing because Helios, the, the god of the sun, tells you something that there was a new element in the sun that was not easily found on earth and because they saw the spectral line they could say there is something new we have never seen before and so the fundamental idea is not just to correctly describe the plasma physics including all the atomic physics but also of course once you have that you can have a new insight into understanding those plasmas, probing those plasmas, and, and developing experiments with these plasmas. So that's, uh, I think, a good introduction to, to what we're hearing today. And I'm very happy Brian is visiting us today, and um, especially for the warm dense matter people, but maybe also to systems biology. It's an interesting thing on how you include those dynamics on different scales and, and learn more about um, uh, including fundamental effects in larger scale codes. So welcome Brian, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, first, one thing I might want to uh, also mention before I start is that um, I'm a master's student in, and I'm currently writing my master thesis over this specific topic. Um, so, with that, let's get started. Um, the uh, basic, uh, basic structure of my talk will be three different parts. First one is, okay, what are we building on? In our specific case, we are building on particle and cell simulation, and particle and cell code, so I will give a, sh give a short introduction to that. Uh, then, the next one is, okay, what do we want to add? In our case, what, does, what are the basic descriptions we want to integrate if we want to say, if we say we want to add atomic physics to pick? And the third part is, uh, okay, how do we actually do that? Uh, for the first part, um, I give, will give you a short description of the basics of plasma physics, shortest possible version, an introduction to the particle and cell principle or the ideas, uh, then I will talk a little bit about how the uh, actual algorithm is implemented, although I won't go into much detail about that. And the fourth point is simply um, a very specific um, fact um, of the implementation of the particle cell that I'm working with. So um, 
that will be uh, more important later. Uh, for uh, atomic physics, we of course will also cover the basics. Um, then we will go on to look at specific sub uh, topics which are important for my work. Um, as some of them give here, and lastly, um, in the last part, I will discuss what we have to think about when we actually want to add atomic physics to paper codes. Okay. With that, what is plasma physics? So, in principle, when a physicist talks about plasma, he usually means two different things. First one, he assumes we have some sort of free moving particles. And um, more to be more specific, he assumes we have uh, free electrons and ions in some diversity. And the second thing he talks about is, of course, electromagnetic fields. That meaning we have two different fields, the elect electric and the magnetic field, and both of them uh, interact with the free moving particles in, um, in feedback loop number. And the most basic description we actually think about in plasma physics are five different equations. The first one is the equation which describes the movement of particles inside the plasma. That's simply the Lorentz force equation. Um, and it simply describes that a particle experiences force due to its own charge and the electric and magnetic field at its relative positions, at its, its position. And the other four equations are the Maxwell equations, and they, in essence, describe how the magnetic fields form and how they develop. Uh, of those four principal equations, two are not really interesting, at least for me simply because they are more a description of the initial conditions we must fulfill in order to be physically correct. Um, so for example, this equation simply says, okay, that um, a magnetic field doesn't have a source, but driver is always in close lines. And the second one simply describes that the source of the electric field are, uh, char is charged. So nothing new there. But what's more interesting are, the, are both equations which describe the uh, time evolution of our fields, because that's what actually interests us. And those are quite interchangeable, apart from this specific term. This term is simply the uh, current term, and this term is, in essence, the movement of particles with charge inside your plasma, and you get, therefore, uh, a feedback loop between the particle moving due to the field and the movement of the particle then changing the actual field that created this movement. And that's also one of the things that makes plasma physics uh, quite complicated. Okay. Now, Pink, can I ask something? Oh, yeah, that's a good on the previous slide, please. Yeah. Um, your first Maxwell equation, the current. Yes. So do you, what current do you take into account? Because you have two types of charged particles, do you take both into account? Yeah. Electronic and yeah, yeah. electronic. And they move independently of each other. And in principle, even every single electron can moves independently of, uh, so you just simply sum of the currents every single particle creates inside your plasma. Mm -hmm. Which is, and you separate, you have, do you separate into two, let's say, components, species? species? Um, that depends on your actual implementation. But in principle, you, you can, of course, do that. Uh, but um, for the actual time evolution, both are simply summed together. So you don't have an E field for electrons and E field for ions. So you get the net. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Uh, okay. So uh, particle cell is, as um, Michael already said, um, some in essence. Um, a simulation technique for plasmas, and specifically the idea with particle and cell simulations is that you uh, use the abstract from the general uh, description, which is physically completely correct, to a more uh, simulate or model approach. And the abstractness you make first, you uh, leave, you go from continuous fields, which every continuous position inside your space has one specific field value, so it's field values on a grid to simply discretize your fields. And the second thing, of course, uh, is you represent the actual particles which we move inside your plasma with so-called pink or macro particles. Um, they are characterized by um, 
fact that they have a continuous velocity in position and the charge. Um, I must specifically note that while it's tempting to say, okay, the part, peak particles are equal to the real particles or are somehow a representation, in actual fact, they are not. They are a specific sampling technique you use to approximate the real uh, trajectories inside the plasma, uh, but the, they are not in itself um, part, um, real physical particles. Okay. Um, the peak simulations, of course, have also time development. And the time development in PIC is generally described as this PIC cycle, which has four main steps, being force calculation, particle push, uh, uh, current to position, and field swap. Um, in essence, the force calculation is simply, okay, we have field values on a grid, we want to interpolate those field values to a position of our actual particle, and then we want to integrate uh, the actual force this particle experienced due to the Lorentz equation over the particle shape. Particle shape is, in essence, uh, you give your big particles um, a shape in a sense, like a distribution of their actual weight. And that's mostly done for numeric reasons. Um, and then, of course, if you have, give your particle such a shape, you, of course, also want to integrate your force over the different over this shape. So, in essence, it's a, a folding of your particle shape with your actual Lorentz force field. Uh, the particle pusher is that part of the code which actually uh, moves your particles, so it updates your position and your velocity for each time stack. And of course, since movement of particles creates um, a current, this current must then also be calculated, and that's and then the current to position step, and this step basically takes the movement of all particles, calculates a current for each cell inside your simulation, and then dumps this current as a current field for each specific cell. And that is then, of course, used for, by the field solver to actually update your fields using the two important Maxwell equations. Um, so that was PIC in the shortest possible version. Um, one question. Yeah. Just a short question. Uh, you talked two slides before, one slide before, uh, about the electric field. Yeah. What is with the magnetic field? Or is it uh, that's encoded in the. Uh, so, in, uh, in principle, electromagnetic field and E field are treated almost equally. Okay. There are some variations, but those depend on how you, what specific field solver you're using. So, for example, the most common field solver, which is the uh, yeast solver, uh, uses um, um, what is it? Um, uses an E and B field, which are separated in space and time. So you do a leapfrog method. In a way. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, so the specific grid the E solver uses has uh, E fields always centered on your face of your. Um, field a cube and the E fields are centered on the edges of your cube. And then, and furthermore, uh, E and B fields are also separated by half a time step. And you, in essence, apply the um, Maxwell equations and use finite difference in, in, to substitute the real derivatives and then simply do a leap for updating your E field with the last B field and so on and so forth. Okay. So we talked about uh, solving the Maxwell's equation, and there is a B field in it. So it was yeah, as an example. Okay. <laughs> um, let me ask you about uh, the forces. So the, just to, from my understanding, when we talk about particle and cell, is the f force always the Lorentz force, or are there can there be other forces? Uh, so the principal force Pig uses is always Lorentz force. Yes. But you can have other contributions which also change the trajectory of particles. For example, uh, collisions is something that is sometimes implemented, sometimes not implemented, depends a bit on your actual pick code. Um, and those implementations are mostly um, you try to represent the actual uh, mechanisms of collisions instead of correctly simulating collisions simply due to the fact that collisions scale with uh, particle number squared, and you tend to have quite a lot of particles. Um, okay. Um, yes. Dun, dun, dun.
Okay. Um, one specific aspect um, relevant for the specific bit code I'm working with, that's big on GPU. Uh, that's a specific code developed by our um, <laughs> group at HZTR. Um, has it's grouping. So what do I mean? Grouping? So in principle, pick has different parallelism levels depending on which uh, which part of the pig cycle we're looking at. The first one is, of course, the force calculation and the actual particle pressure. Those are parallel in your particles. And the second thing is, of course, your current deposition and the field solver. Those are, are parallel in your cells, which is perfectly fine and allows you to very nicely uh, parallelize your pig codes. But they have one small caveat. That, and this caveat is that they actually share input data between different uh, particles in the different cells. For example, by the force calculation, if you consider all of those big particles which are inside the same cell, they essentially use the same field data values for the interpolation. So, of course, if you simply do the most basic parallelism, what you would do is simply, okay, I have a particle, I know which cell it is, I'm going to load the field values of the cell, or maybe the neighboring, then do the interpolation, forget the field values, take the next part. Which, of course, leads to the fact that you essentially load those field values twice, not more, and you try to avoid that because loading data on GPUs is really costly. In comparison to actual calculator. And of course, for the field solver, you have a similar problem due to the fact that you're using finer difference. You, of course, need some sort of neighboring value. And this neighboring value is reused at least by one other cell. Therefore, same problem. And you can, of course, avoid that if you group your data and simply load blocks of data, process them in one go sequentially, and then use deal with the next block or parallel build explore. And that's exactly what Picon GPU does. Specifically in Picon GPU, what we do is we group cells to so-called super cells, that's typically simply eight by eight by four cells, as some sort of chunk of space you're working on. And you lead load, of course, all field values of those cells in one go, therefore avoid loading them twice for, seal, uh, for cells inside this volume, in addition to a guard region, which allows you to get some sort of neighbor region of this super cell. And the second thing is um, the same thing you, of course, do for particles, in which you simply group your particles into so-called particle frames. Um, the idea here is that you um, simply say, OK, we have we group our particles by, which, by the question in which super cell they actually are. And since there tend to be quite a lot of particles, we don't want to load all of them at once. But instead, what we do is we group them in some sort of array list, and each of the sub-arrays, which that's what actually is called a particle frame, that's one grouping of particles we are working on for one specific time. And of course, uh, since we can load the uh, supercell field values uh, for this specific uh, sub-array, because they all belong to one specific supercell, we can of course also uh, work on them without loading new data again. These cells, uh, are these representing real space in a Cartesian mesh, is that? Yeah. And what's the typical dimension of one of these cells? Uh, that depends on your density. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can expect something like, um, so they are really, really small. So you get normally about um, at least 10 to maybe even 300 or 400 um, cells inside one single wavelength of your laser using for your plasma simulation. Um, laser wavelength is in the order of 800 nanometers, so you get about a maximum two nanometers per dimension. So, so usually a tenth or twentieth of the skin depth. <coughs> so really finely resolved. Uh, good point, because that will also be important later. <laughs> um, okay, that covers what we actually start with. Um, yet now, the next question is, what do we want to add? So, in principle, if you have followed very closely, until now we have uh, simply described ions as a particle which has maybe a shape and a charge, and that's it. The charge may change, that's 
already um, an extension, but in principle, we have given an, it an external state, which is a position in Rossi, and an internal state, which only consists of the charge. But in reality, particles are uh, ions are a little bit more complicated in physics. And the actual physics we want to include, that's what actually is atomic physics. Uh, in principle, this um, it's not a problem that we don't include uh, atomic physics in all peak simulations, uh, but it limits us in effect to uh, using average or ground states of those ions. And of course, a physicist always wants to be as close uh, to nature as he can manage. So if we want to model things like excitations and de-excitations of an internal state um, or basic dynamics of those internal states which are much larger than the simple charge we of course have to include them and that's what i'm currently doing maybe another question to, for the general scope so do you what do you assume on the velocities of the ions and the electrons do you work only in one regime where one is faster than the other or are they, do they have com comparable velocities? Uh, in principle, you can do anything. Uh, so you're not limited to specific distributions of velocity. You're not limited to, to specific um, comparison between velocities of uh, groups of electrons or ions or ions and electrons. Mm -hmm. But there are, of course, some limitations due to implementation. But in principle, the algorithm could deal with any distribution you give it. It's just yeah. the, feas the computational feasibility which uh, can trick you a little bit. So is one big particle a collection of electrons and ions or is it just a collection of electrons and just a collection of ions? Um, in, so they are neither collections. Uh, so in principle what a big particle is, it's a sample point inside your face space. So um, for those maybe not familiar with the idea of a phase space, uh, if you take a particle in physics and you define um, all the fields resolved in time and give it a starting position and a starting velocity, in principle, you could mathematically determine its trajectory. In reality, that's a little bit more complicated, but yeah. Um, and uh, the six-dimensional space, which is actually um, created by the velocity and uh, position starting conditions, that's what's generally called phase space, and the idea of a thick particle or macro particle, as they're also called, is simply, okay, we are randomly sampling our phase space, um, and then we look how a particle of this specific phase space point would move and use this to approximate the real movement of particle inside of us. But that's, of course, dependent on your actual number of sample points. And it also means that your particles are not collection of particles, but simply phase-based test particles in a way. But they are, they are chosen for each species. So for an electron, you have a, you have a phase space. Yeah. And for each species of ions, okay. even charged states can be so. Yeah. OK. And all have their secrets. And that can even further, you can even further divide them if you choose to do so. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, the basics of atomic physics is that you, instead of looking or considering the ion simply some point or shape, um, we acknowledge that an ion is actually consist, consists of parts. In our specific case, um, all ions consist of an atomic core, which has actual fixed charge and um, this fixed charge creates a potential in which you then have discrete stable electron states. Um, I don't know if you, the uh, listener, not reader, um, the last week's talk actually walked you through how you would solve the uh, Schrodinger equation to get, to get those discrete states, but in essence that's what you are Building on. You're still you're solving a differential equation, and the solution functions are those specific electron states. Um, and of course, in addition to your actual atomic core, you have an electron hull, which can uh, contain a variable number of bound electrons. Uh, each of these electrons occupies one specific state, 
um, and due to physics, the electrons can't actually share uh, one specific electron state. So this electron state is really occupied in the uh, sense of the um, one of the most common states, and one I'm actually also using, are the so-called hydrogen states. Those are simply analytic solutions for the specific hydrogen atom, which is uh, important for physics because it's one of the only atoms which you can actually analytically solve, due to the fact that it has only one electron. And the solutions are, in S, can be indexed by four different indices. Uh, N is the main or principal quantum number. That's simply um, an index of your energy of your particle. And then you get uh, three, different, three additional uh, quantum numbers, namely angular momentum, set direction of angular momentum and spin. And as far as this talk is concerned, you just have to remember what their actual value spaces are. For N, it's a whole number starting with one. Uh, then the L quantum number is one whole number in the region from one uh, from zero to n minus one, and m is from minus zero to uh, from minus L to plus L in one steps. Once again, a whole um, number, and S is either one plus one half and minus one and half. Why specific those values? Uh, you can read up if you want yourself, but in principle, those are the values. Um, and just for a remark, if you want a general solution for uh, an atom which can't be seen as a hydrogen atom, you pretty much have to solve the um, ion numerically. And due to the fact that that takes quite a lot of um, calculation time, I tend, and it's not really feasible for my approach. Okay. Um, of course, those bound electrons aren't going to be stable in their states forever. Uh, in actual fact, they can change their state, and that's in principle due to some sort of disturbance of the atomic potential of your atomic core, and this simply leads to the fact, um, leads to the fact that your originally stable electron states are no longer stable, and the electron can just switch states. Um, this can be due to photon interactions, if you have simply some sort of radiation impinging on your atom. Uh, it can be residual interactions, so uh, especially what that essentially means is if you have an uh, atom which has uh, more than one electrons, those electrons also interact with each other. And since we mostly tend to solve um, ion or those electron states for one specific electron, these um, interactions are not actually contained, so there are some sort of residual interactions, and those can also change your uh, electron state. And the last one is, of course, if you have some sort of external field like laser, you can also use this to change your electron state. Um, yes, and there are, in, in effect, a few different results that can happen. The easiest one is, of course, you can simply lift an electron to a higher energy uh, level or even just different energy level, that's also possible. And you can, of course, also uh, lower to a lower energy level if one of those energy level uh, states is actually free. Um, the second thing you can, you can, of course, um, do is you can remove one of those and I electrons from your ion and therefore increase or reduce its charge if you capture one. Um, yeah, that's in essence it. There are some... There are some further complications if you uh, go into detail, but in principle, those are things you can actually do. You can change your state, electron state, inside your uh, atom. Okay, um, that was the general introduction to atomic physics if you use the general classical approach. And plasmas, we have the Added, um, the added uh, difficulty that normally in atomic physics you simply deal with one atom and describe it in, as a closed system which uh, doesn't interact much with its environment. In the plasma, that's not really feasible. Of course, first of all, we have quite a lot of neighboring ions. And secondly, we have also free electrons which also interact with all atoms. So what does that actually change? Uh, so in principle, if we have neighboring ions, those ions also have potential, and those potentials are 
going to overlap. Um, that essentially creates a local maximum of your potential, which in itself is not really that complicated or new. Uh, but what also creates, or an effect that it creates, is that you have an um, effective ionization potential depression. So um, the ionization potential describes, in essence, how much energy you have to give an electron before it can um, leave your ion. Um, and of course, if you have, if you lower your actual potential volt, you can reduce the energy an electron actually has to get in order to leave your ion because it doesn't have to um, leave it, uh, that uh, that potential one. Um, and in essence, that has another um, side effect, namely that in contrast to the regular atomic physics in which n is not limited and plasmas you actually get a maximum principal quantum number simply because electrons above this quantum number are no longer bound to your atom. Um, so that, well, that's what neighboring ions do to you. What do free electrons do to atomic physics? Uh, in principle they simply give you a new disturbance source. Wherefore, where before you could simply, you had to rely on radiation, now you can simply take energy from an electron which flies by your atom or ion, and that can also provide the energy you need to switch a state, uh, which has some advantages because in contrast to photons, uh, electrons can give you a continuous value of energy because they simply can leave your atom. Um, the principle doesn't change much, but minor details. And the next thing, of course, is if you have free electrons, you can, of course, also capture them. But if they're not present, would you catch? Can, can I ask something? Yeah. On the slide. Um, so on the first part of neighboring ions, it's something, it's more a fundamental question about pick I have, which I didn't, mm -hmm. don't quite get, is so even if you, well, I guess maybe this is what you're introducing. So right there is this interaction between ions themselves, so not the effect of the ion on... In physics, yes. In pig, it's a little bit more complicated. So, in principle, I guess this effect is captured in the Lorentz force, because um, it then generates fields because of the configuration positions of the ions in space, but... Um, in principle, that's to a Maxwell equation, but um, so the... Uh, if you remember the you have the equation that the uh, source of the electric field is a charge. Yeah. And in essence, if you have a charge like an atomic core, that of course creates an electric field, and that's what we call the potential. Uh, in essence, this electric field has a potential. Yes. So the question is, so do you take this into account in, in, a, in a pick, or can you uh, take it into account, or is it indirectly? Or indirectly. Okay. So what you do, usually do is you uh, set the... Um, maximum principal quantum number as a param parameter and simply say, okay, we have, uh, we calculate the ion density inside your local pixel mm -hmm. and this gives you a value of your principal quantum number, or at least it could give you a value of your principal quantum number, simply by the assumption you have, okay, those ions are mostly evenly spaced out in your cell and uh, how, what's the actual uh, density of ions, and then you can calculate the, uh, what you expect for the uh, IPD to be, although those models are <coughs> difficult to deal with, let's just say that. Uh, they can give you wide different results, and if you actually try to um, experimentally look into or measure those IPD values, which you can do, they tend to differ quite heavily from what you have easy models to predict. So it's a um, double-edged sword to actually include them. But actually unrelated to IPD, uh, when you uh, think back about your Maxwell equations, that there's an equation mm -hmm. that generates the gradient of the electric field uh, from the uh, density. Do you... Those, uh, so this is the... Uh, um, depending on the ionic distribution. Um, so pick norm, uh, most pick roads don't include an actual Gaussian so a Gauss solver. Okay. for this specific equation. Um, the we uh, it tends to be avoided, avoided by the fact that you say, okay, we start with a plasma which is neutrally charged because there doesn't have an inherent charge. 
And if you assume this as your starting conditions, your time evolution equations won't change the um, actual density. Uh, so in essence, you, if you assure that at the starting point of your simulation, your plasma is actually at every specific point um, charge neutral in each cell, then uh, you, will, you don't have to actually um, solve those, this specific equation. Of course, it's in essence time independent. Okay. It isn't changed by the Maxwell equation, by the remaining Maxwell equations. Um, okay. If you don't do that, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Like me, if it's, it's not constant, right? it should change. I, I mean, maybe it's a. It's a uh, so long as you don't, in, uh, don't in create a new um, charge without creating uh, the respective. Um, charge to so if you simply separate only separate charges in your volume, mm -hmm. then the equation is actually um, already included. And the liquid, so, yeah, maybe can come back to this later. Yeah. And it, maybe one of the things that you should remark also is that we are talking about a very short instance in time. So the mm -hmm. changes we are talking about. In, I, I think the potential changes at one point, but in the next time step. Yeah, um, yeah so in essence, our uh, field solver time step is somewhere in the order of 10 to minus 17 seconds. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be very careful to, okay. to correctly predict the currents. In a, okay. in, a, in, a high, in a dense plasma, the time step we need to simulate the plasma is usually and this is why we are actually doing this on the same time scale it takes an electron to go once around the atomic nucleus <laughs> if you use the most basic approximation more, more or less the, it's the, the entire point that's puzzling me is so you have the Lorentz force but then what about forces induced when you have separation of electrons and ions, right? Then they move. Uh, that's uh, that's covered over your current. So that's all covered in the current. Okay. Yeah. The only thing that's not covered is the dynamics of the electrons while they are still attached to the atom. Okay. So once they are becoming free, we assume them at, at classic, as classical, not as quantum mechanic. They are just classical electrons that can, can run around freely. And we take care that in general, the charge distribution follows um, the, uh, the uh, uh, Gauss law. And that's about it. But whatever happens inside the atom, where we assume that the Lorentz force does not play a strong role, mm -hmm. but instead the plasma properties as a whole play a much stronger role. But I think Brian will go there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so basically the, the time evolution internal to an atom that you but at least at this, at this, up to this point we discussed, your neglect is can be ten attoseconds, depending on your time step of your yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. So actually, Brian, we come to this that there are time scales which you have to take care of. All right. And also, you have to remember that if you actually talk or if you actually consider electrons inside an atom, directly using Maxwell equations is a little bit difficult. <laughs> So there are versions of the Maxwell equations, but not specifically Maxwell equations. So at this specific scale, you're actually talking about quantum physics, and this, you can solve it, but it's um, different. And um, I also have a question. Yeah. It's a bit fundamental. So is the concept of ionization potential depression real? And because you said that one could measure it, so how would one measure it? Uh, so in essence, what you can do is you can actually measure the ionization potential. Oh. Uh, that's also a question I asked my experimental professor, but he said he didn't know, <laughs> uh, but the textbook says it is possible. Um, I guess there's, there's, there's 
Somewhere there is Max here. So the most the explanation I came up with with this prism principally simply to a spectroscopic uh, measurement. Because you can uh, look for this specific frequency which allows you to ionize your plasma further. And you can then, in essence, see the um, capture, the specific capture condition. The one um, for, um, related question then, how do you um, yeah, distinguish bound and free electrons? Um, you distinguish them by the, by the spectrum, uh, by the spectrum they create when they absorb a photon. Because uh, free electrons have a continuous spectrum, but bounds are discrete. I mean, so the transition between the two must also be continuous, ironically. Uh, yeah, that's from physics. Okay, yeah. um, <laughs> I won't venture to provide the specific part because I'm not quite sure I know everything about that specific part. Fair enough, it's quite complicated actually. Yes. Since we do not, uh, there is, as Tobias already mentioned, there is no. It's, it's difficult to have a clear distinction between when an electron is bound and when an electron is purely free in such a situation. And usually you do this by looking at, um, at interactions and then doing a really thorough quantum mechanical model and then see whether your quantum mechanical model fits well enough to what you're observing. And the whole structural information or much of the structural information if you're not doing going by a bound, bound transition actually that comes from this directly again. So this is by no means an, in, an, an easy thing. Sometimes you can do this looking at absorption boundaries or something and, and preparing stuff in a very certain way, but in general, it's not very easy. Yeah. So, so are you assuming a fixed number of free electrons up to now? Um, is it, or is so it going to fluctuate? So the basic, peak, the most basic implementation assumes you have a fixed number of electrons. But there are very few people which are still using those implementations. Okay. Um, the uh, a little bit of a more advanced version says, okay, of course, the ion can change its charge state, and we stop our modeling at the charge state. And when you reduce or reduce your charge state, uh, then of course you have to capture an electron. If you increase your charge state, then of course you have to release an electron. So then those are not, um, at least the electron number is not constant. Um, the I number should probably be constant in such a simulation. Because <laughs> I doubt there are currently plasmas we can correctly uh, model which actually allow you to create new, uh, <laughs> at least not in laser acceleration yet. That's an interesting thing you're mentioning. <laughs> Of course, one of the things that, that can come up at one point is fusion, of course. You yeah. can have fusion processes in highly dense plasmas, and you can model it in the same way that you would model the interaction of electrons with the ions by simply saying, now I have a collision of two ions, for example, helium or, or hydrogen or whatever, and out comes something that has fused together. You can, of course, do that, but that also requires you to use quite a uh, quite heavy uh, additional modeling just for correctly modeling the no, no, you just in course. You just do the cross-section. It's actually <laughs> quite easy. Much easier because the cross-section does not depend strongly on the plasma properties, unlike in the electron case. It yeah. usually just depends on, on relative velocity and density, but not much really, so the, 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 the core potential for fusion doesn't change much, <laughs> Bit, but not much. Yeah. But the problem is the, the interaction actually with the, with the inner shell electrons, so they can change things again. And getting your data. 
because most of the data for that specific data subject is not freely available. Of course, it has <laughs> other applications as well. Some phone numbers. Yeah. <laughs> I would have one more question. Yeah. So the electrons here, are they coupled to some kind of bath or do they feel an effect of temperature? Uh, in PIC, not. Because in PIC, you don't tend to assume a specific electron temperature. Which electrons? The ones inside the atom or the. I, mean, I, don't, I don't distinguish boundary fields, so for me, all electrons. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe in this distinction. But so, in essence, uh, <laughs> so any, my question would be any. So, the free electrons, normally you don't assume temperature for them because that would, in essence, just um, set a specific profile you would expect. And uh, specifically in laser plasma simulations, those profiles don't necessarily actually occur. And for the uh, bound electrons, uh, yes, you could in principle define temperature, but why? I mean, it's a physical question whether at these conditions that is relevant or not. I mean, do you have a mechanism how energy is transferred to them externally, and can you model this as a bath or not? Uh, so, we have a mechanism how to transfer energy to them, uh, but it's not normally defined as a bath. You, the idea is to more closely model the actual physical process. <coughs> I, you can, I think you would come to this. Yeah. So that's a good question. There is no temperature in case. Mm -hmm. should that be? Sorry? Should that be temperature? I mean, there is no, no, that be if you have a temperature, you probably shouldn't be using peak. Because it would be much easier to use different simulation uh, simulation algorithms, like for example uh, MHD or Plasma Planck uh, simulations, to actually solve your plasma. Because they are less dependent on hardware, they are faster, and they can even give you more information okay. under some conditions um, if you have a temperature. Is it then a non-equilibrium argument? Why yeah. is it so good that I? Uh, thank you. <laughs> but what about the bound states? So you also neglect temperature in the. They also don't have to be in an equilibrium. And specifically, we are actually interested in those cases which okay. are in which they are not in equilibrium. Of course, if they are, you can your life gets much easier. <laughs> Probably you'll come to this, but so you don't. So you will occupy the atomic states according to some yeah, statistics, yeah. but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fermi Dirac or whatever. Um, that will come up later. <laughs> uh, okay, so next step is of course now we have an uh, one, we have one single uh, uh, single ion inside our plasma. Uh, now we of course want to have many ions, and if we want many ions, we want some sort of distribution. And um, first thing, first thing we of course have to do is for distribution we have to define our states. In our specific case, we define one atomic state. Uh, and one atomic state in this sense means, okay, which specific electron states are occupied. And then for, the, for all those possibilities, we assign them a number. And then we can, of course, say, okay, for this specific state, for this number, what is its density, locally resolved. And for all those different states, we can, of course, then build a simple population vector. And that's the basic quantity um, atomic physics and plasma usually uses. So I'm confused. Uh, so what is so is it n vector? Is that uh, now <coughs> atomic state population vector? So is that the density of the ions? Yeah. Okay. Um, I must admit the notation is a little bit confusing because we have the principal quantum number n and the density, also n, and then the n vector, which is then the atomic state population vector. Welcome to physics again, <laughs> by the way. We had this discussion with, with Max already. It's always the same humor. <laughs> I try to distinguish between the three uh, by at, uh, utilizing the uh, density related um, quantities and not utilizing the uh, quantum number. I'm still confused what this is. So, <laughs> so in essence, so what you, you have a number of states. Of what kind of state? At, uh, uh, atomic electron. state. So uh, in, in essence, um, you have an electron that has one specific electron state. Okay. Then you have a bunch of electrons, 
those also occupy one specific electron state in one Each. atom. We're yeah. still in one atom. Okay. And then that defines you this atomic state of your atom. And now you give the density of one specific atomic state inside your plasma, and then you and then you uh, say, okay, we don't have just one atomic state, but we have many. What are the specific densities for each of those different atomic states? And then you simply list them in a, in a vector. Okay. And that's the atomic state population vector. Population as in you give all possible atomic states, and for each of them the distribution. So it's a density of states for a given point. Point. Yeah. And time. And time. Yeah. Okay. And in essence, that's also what um, what you can see on the right side. Where you have an ion which has a specific uh, configuration. Uh, so that's your atomic state. Then you assign a number to the specific ion, in this case state one, and then you say, okay, what's the density of this specific state? And you can of course do that for all different states, and then you get this atomic state population vector. So basically, so at each point in you move up space, space time and space, yeah, have uh, energy resolved density of states at that point. Is that what? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But, okay, so that's kind of it's basically a local density of states. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, it, the problem with that is usually you would have one density of state, but since we are um, we are not we are not assuming a flat density, flat temperature in a certain volume. But actually, probing that at much higher resolution with some form of phase space description by sampling the phase space with our particles, we have to make it in such a way that we describe the density of states everywhere in the cells with its specific value given by how many at atoms with a certain state can be found in the cell where because in hydro we would have a full cell density temperature that gives you one density of states but now we have an atom we have some some phase space blob here some phase space blob here and, da, 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 and they can have very different states so what we're in essence doing is uh, having a much higher resolution than in principle possible with hydro simulations, for example. Much higher resolution. That's the goal. That's the goal. And you assume, at this point, you assume hydrogenic orbitals as the states of each atom. Yeah, yeah. as the electronic states of each atom. In principle, you could, uh, you could every base you could think of, so long as it's um, at least somehow, uh, at least it doesn't have infinite members, or at least you somehow kept a sort of kind of number of members. Um, but in principle, I'm using hydrogen like states. And each ion has a specific state, and the distribution follows them from looking at all ions. Yeah. Um, we will actually discuss that. <laughs> okay. uh, so, uh, yeah, that gives us our basic quantity, our atomic state population vector. Now, this population vector is all nice and well, but we want to know its dynamics. And that's described by this simple seeming weight equation. So in essence, what you do is you simply say, okay, we have a specific known rate of change from one state to the next. Um, we simply take the matrix, uh, write as a matri giant matrix and take the current state um, that gives us our change. Um, therefore, we get the equation. Uh, this equation is deceptively simple because it looks linear, but in reality, is not really linear. Because you have, you can have couplings inside your rates to your actual um, current atomic state population, which makes it a little bit more complicated. Um, but it at least manage, uh, allows us to combine all those different possible uh, processes of one specific matrix and forget about what specifically we use. Okay. Sorry. Saying it's not linear because R and and on the details. Yeah. Okay. 
and our has a quite a vivid feedback to your actual atomic uh, plasma uh, atomic state and uh, your plasma conditions. So it's nothing you can simply say, okay, it's, 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 it's a fancy way of hiding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, I'm going to physics. <laughs> now, that is a very good approach in physics and in general. He's <laughs> doing DFT, so. <laughs> okay. So that in essence concludes what I wanted to give you as an introduction to atomic physics. I hope it was at least somewhat understandable. Um, now comes comes the interesting part: how do we actually marry those two different concepts? Um, so, as a summary, what we actually want to do is we want to give the big particles a new property, oh, specifically the big ions, but yeah, uh, namely an atomic state, uh, and we want to model the interactions with electrons and fields of this atomic state. And uh, the implementation is essentially split up in three different steps. First one is, okay, how do we store this atomic state? Second thing is, of course, how do we update the atomic state? And the third one is, how we do we actually calculate the weights we need for updating the state? And in this order, I worked through the specific problem. And in this order, I'm going to lead you to what I consider a sufficient solution. OK, so let's start with how we want to so the electrons do. Electron is also a big particle. Right? Yeah. So they don't have the atomic state property. Uh, no. Uh, so the electrons not really because they are elementary particles. Yeah, so you have two kind of two kinds of particles. No? In electrons yes. and big ions and big electrons. And big big ions. ions have an atomic state and big electrons don't. Okay. Um, Okay. Um, of course, I already covered this. What the first thing, of course, we have, to, we have to give is which specific electron state model are we using? And in this specific case, I'm using hydrogen light shield electron state models. Uh, shield simply means, okay, uh, we also include an energy shift due to um, some sort of um, a mean field residual interaction between electrons inside your atom. Is that a quantum defect? Like you have the Rydberg formula and then you can shift by adding an energy term there? Is that? Yeah, in mean? essence, yes. You do. Um, in, at least that's the principle. So what you do is you uh, take your actual correct uh, interaction Hamiltonian and then you um, take the average of, between, of the interaction between electrons and electrons inside your atom and use this in order to get a, another energy term. So you mean uh, you compute the classical electrostatic interaction? Um, mm, not that specific way. Uh, I also have to add that that's the principle. What you know, reality do is you simply use uh, experimentally semi uh, semi empirical values, uh -huh. which give you a close enough approximation of your experimental results. So there are tables of those values, and you simply use these tables, and those are good enough for our purposes, at least. Um, and of course, why do we specifically want to use hydrogen-like states? Because they are analytically known, so we can actually write them down. They are somehow somewhat close to what we in reality expect. And they give us an energy which is close enough to what we experimentally see, so probably should work. In principle, um, I have to mention that um, if you uh, don't want to actually include atomic physics in PIC, but specifically use uh, different approaches for atomic physics and plasma, you can of course also use different uh, atomic um, electron state models. Um, and they tend to differ in the results, but I want to start with the easy, easy case, not to overburden. Uh, you can, in principle, um, also include those more complicated models, but of course, <coughs> also needs more work. Um, the first thing we, of course, have to decide is 
if the atomic state should be field or pick particle attribute. Uh, so um, the which one of those becomes uh, feels more natural for you it depends a little bit on where you start. So if you start with the usual atomic physics and uh, plasma approach, then of course the field-based approach is more close because you simply assume you have some sort of uh, atomic state distribution and you simply say, okay, one of those per cell and be done with it. If you come from the peak per version, it's of course more natural to say, okay, it's actually a peak particle attribute because in reality it is a particle attribute. And in fact, that's also the better way to actually do this. Simply due to the fact that uh, if you want to look at the actual change of your, um, um, of your actual atomic state population distribution, um, the time derivation of this has two parts. The first one is your local time derivative, uh, which we can somehow is somewhat easily simulate, but you have also the more difficult version, which is the uh, change of your atomic state population due to drift or simply movement of your ions inside your fossil. And um, this specific part of your equation would become very difficult if you want to use cell-based approach because you would have to somehow um, use a, some sort of fluid model to model how this atomic state population flows to different cells. But we don't want to use fluid models because we want to use PIG. So not a good idea to do this. It's simply incorrect in our con in our context to simply average over different trajectories inside your cell and say, okay, all of those are the same and um, therefore we can simply do some sort of fluid model. What we actually must do is we must somehow bind this attribute to our actual microparticle, which will produce quite a lot of problems for us. Of course, there are really, really quite a lot of different atomic states. So um, to get some sort of feeling, uh, if we just want to calculate the number of electron states, which is simply we sum over how many different um, uh, possible uh, electron states are there up to a given maximum quantum number, in this case I choose six as some sort of big value. And if you do that, you get about 182 different electron states, which is acceptable if you want to do distribution about that. But the problem is you don't only have the electron state, but you also must describe um, which of those actually occupy. And if you do that with the uh, changing number of um, electrons you can have from zero to your actual maximum charge, the actual charge of your core, in this case I use 22 as an example, you get something like 10 to the order of 28 different atomic states. And representing them Although that many different atomic states for even one cell is <coughs> unfeasible. Okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe I just choose my values poorly. So let's take a look at how those scale for different atomic numbers, so for different maximum number of electrons. And you see that actually I might have already been somewhat conservative, with the maximum being something like 10 to order 55 doesn't get much better. And the lowest one gets you to somewhere in the millions if you just treat, if you only look at low, uh, at the small atomic cores. But we don't actually don't, we want to actually look at those higher core number, higher core electron counts because those are what is available as foils. So not a good idea. How do we solve them? Uh, the first idea you may have, uh, first idea is okay, instead of actually recording the specific configuration as an atomic state, we can use something that's called super configuration. In essence, the idea is okay, we group um, configurations which are close or equal in energy and simply say, okay, we don't distinguish between them. Uh, for example, in my case, since I'm using shielded uh, hydrogen-like electron states, all electron states which have the same occupation numbers actually have the same energy. Okay, so we don't have, we simply only have to record those occupation numbers, therefore. And that, of course, makes our state at least somewhat more few, um, smaller. Uh, but if you calculate how many 
of those possible states you have, it's still quite a large number. So that's the formula in essence, you simply say, okay, we have n squared, two n squared different uh, um, values or different uh, values of occupation number for each principal quantum number, plus one because zero is also a possible value. And then we simply multiply them because they can, of course, um, vary independently. A little bit more elegantly, uh, elegantly, you can also include that you don't uh, can't have more than set different electrons. So everything large, uh, every occupation number larger than that is also not possible. But even if you do that, you still get ten to the order of seven different states, and therefore would have to represent them with ten to the order of seven uh, bytes for one simple distribution. So it's still not really feasible. Okay, what else can we do? Of course, we can reduce the number of uh, the maximum principal quantum number up to which we go. Um, that is feasible, gives you um, at least some reduction. So if you go to the lowest possible value, which still at least includes most of the physics you want to include, which is about four, you still need about 10,000 different states, uh, 15,000 to be precise. Um, which is more manageable, but still too large for one for including the complete distribution in one specific market plotting. So, what do we do? Have, do we have to give up? Uh, yes and no. We have to give up something, and what we give up is we don't we can't store the complete distribution in one specific market plotting. What we can store is one specific atomic state. And simply say, okay, the distribution is available if you take all of the particles inside yourself. And therefore, do you, in essence, reduce the number of the memory you require per macroparticle and simply distribute the memory over your macroparticles inside yourself? Um, which would, in theory, work if your number of macroparticles wouldn't be low. Um, because in principle, if you actually set up your simulation, you have something of the order of 10 micro ions per cell. And we have just calculated that we expect something like 10,000 different atomic states. So we would in essence cover 10 of 10,000 different atomic states. That doesn't sound like good coverage to me. Uh, but what about a supercell? Of course, a supercell contains, in our case, about 256 different cells. So if we talk about a supercell, get into a region that you might be able to cover about one third of your total atomic states. And that could be good enough, depending on what you actually want to do with it and what your actual use case is. So, so I just jump in here because I think you haven't much talked about what a supercell is. Um, so maybe as a small I covered it in the beginning. Yeah. Okay, so that's fine. Just as a reminder, if everybody was hi, uh, <laughs> just remember what it is. <laughs> um, I can of course repeat, but no, no, fine. If everybody knows, I was just jumping. Okay. In. Uh, yeah. Um, so that's the idea. Like we, in essence, lose resolution of your atomic state population but reduce the memory required. Um, in this approach also leads to numerical diffusion, which I will cover a little bit later, but yeah, good enough for me at least, it works. Uh, one further thing I want to mention is, uh, of course, uh, peak simulations tend to be memory staffed, not computational staffed, simply because we have a large number of particles and large number of cells. And therefore, it's quite important that you try to minimize the memory footprint you have in every possible way you can have. And um, one specific way we can actually do this, this specific point is that instead of storing the actual occupation numbers as a vector, which would be a natural thing, we instead only store the index, which is normally a solution which can give you 
better results, but also carries with it the uh, disadvantage that you somehow have to have to keep your um, conversion table in memory. In this specific case, we don't have to, because we know what the actual structure of those occupation numbers is. And we can use the structure to actually um, reduce our memory quite significantly to about one third of the usual memory you would have per particle. And the idea behind this reduction of memory is uh, simply that we use uh, we specific we use a specific order of occupation state. So we, uh, the specific order we are using is we start with a completely ionized ion, which has no which has a zero in all occupation numbers, and then we um, iterate just in um, just as you do in probability um, in some sort of combinatorial massive matrix to cover all possible states. And since we know which specific boundary values each of the different uh, occupation, uh, occupation numbers has, because they are defined by physics, uh, we can actually say, okay, we know when a specific occupation number is going to come up in our combinatorial sheet. Uh, so in principle, the formula is given here. What you can do is uh, you can simply plug in your occupation numbers and that's, in essence, a step with which gives you on how many um, uh, how many indices you're going to iterate over until one um, until you get from uh, n equals zero to n equal one, then again from n equal one to n equal two, and so on and so forth. And that directly allows you to calculate your index. And of course, that's also reversible because you have, in essence, a table. And you can, of course, reverse this table if you simply start with the largest index and say, okay, which is the largest possible uh, multiple of your step length you can actually pack into your index. And then that gives you your largest possible occupation, uh, the, the largest uh, in essence, not uh, largest in sense of um, the occupation number corresponding to the largest principal quantum number and then work from that one backwards. So in essence, due to physics structure, we are able to avoid a conversion table and actually save memory with this approach. Um, yeah, okay. So far, so good. Uh, so in essence, we have a wide store of atomic states, as simply an integer number, and we can convert this integer number if we need to occupation numbers, which is our actual atomic status. Okay, good. Next step is we want to have some sort of weight equation solved. Um, in principle, since we actually store only one atomic state in our uh, in each specific macroparticle, um, we the weight equation um, simply falls into many different weight equations. One for each specific um, ion or a big iron you're talking about, and looks in essence quite manageable. So simply this term, you have some sort of initial value that gives you simply the weight of your specific uh, microparticle, and then you get for each specific state, it could change to a rate which it does so, and that gives you your change of this specific microparticle. Um, the problem is, First of all, we have committed to only storing one specific state in our microparticle, but this equation takes one state and makes many. So we have to deal with that. And the second thing is, of course, we want to do this as parallel as possible. Because we want to optimize our simulation, we need to optimize it. Okay, so first approach, uh, maybe, I, okay, before we go to what I did, um, I just wanted to mention what the standard solution for our equation solver is, just as some sort of um, background. Um, in essence, I picked as example FlyCheck, which is a non-local uh, thermal equilibrium code. And in essence, it calculates the spontaneous uh, the rate, uh, rate matrix based on either um, temperature parameters or an external spectrum you can provide and then solves this equation for the static case, 
and an optical film medium that is simply okay sorted. In the optical thick medium, uh, you also add an, an escape factor, which gives you some sort of feedback loop, which you can then iteratively solve for your equation, and then you get, would normally get a result. Uh, it doesn't work in our case because, uh, first of all, we don't actually have a distribution. So we can't easily simply multiply the distribution with our rate matrix. And even if we were to simply uh, create this distribution from our actual particle data, we would then have to have, get a new distribution and would then somehow have to um, take, distribute this new distribution to our macro particles. And how would we do that? It's not easy. So, okay, we need something different. Um, the first um, idea I had is simply, okay, we are going to try to use Monte Carlo. And the idea is, okay, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know what to do, you know, everybody, everybody with problems in this <laughs> round usually resorts to using Monte Carlo. <laughs> so, uh, since Monte Carlo can mean quite a lot of different things, what do I mean with that? So, the idea is, okay, we have some sort of initial state. Uh, we calculate a probability due to the formula here below um, of changing into a new state. And then we follow the dice and say, okay, into which specific state uh, now do we change to? And yeah, that's a new state. Change the number of your, that's uh, stored in your microparticle and go to the next one. This method is easily parallelizable, at least in principle. Um, should, in theory, by, if you choose the probability correctly, um, we produce the rate equation and allows you to have one atomic state in each particle and still get work of them in parallel. And um, in theory, this approach does actually work if you use this uh, probability. And you also have to um, follow this specific condition for your time step. Um, I will explain where that comes in the next four um, slides. So, first of all, why this specific step? So, uh, in principle, in PIC itself, you have a constant time step. That's simply given by your uh, simulation setup. Uh, and due to the fact that we have a Maxwell equation, which are wave equations, you, your time resolution is actually bound to your spatial resolution. So. Yeah, some of the <laughs> advantages or disadvantages of it. Um, and now, if we we can of course imagine the point that uh, one specific entry of our weight matrix multiplied with our time step is larger than one. If this happens, what you actually do is you are creating new uh, iron, or at least new iron weights. Of course, what you do is you start with a specific weight. You multiply it by a number which is larger than one, and you get a new, uh, the new weight, and this weight has grown. That's not a good idea. <laughs> so, in essence, you, what you would do is re you would create ions if you do that. So, not a good idea. We have just created an unstable solver, and if you are familiar with the um, Euler solvers, that's same condition for the specific same reasons. Okay, so we have to save it all. Uh, okay, now we can't on the fly change our peak time step, but our rate is actually something that's variable in time. So how do we solve that? Okay, simple idea, we simply take integer multiples or integer uh, multiples of our actual atomic time step is equal to our peak time step. Yeah. Takes a little bit more work, but avoids the <coughs> unstable conditions. Very well, that at least solves that problem. But what remains is, of course, um, how do we get the probability for each specific new state? And in principle, the idea is um, we simply use a scaled version of our rate, because our rate, in essence, gives us how many of one specific species change to one specific other species. And we want to simply uh, get an average value in the rate equation. And now if we roll the dice, of course, this average value is equal to your probability 
at least in the under ideal condition. Um, so that gives us um, this formula. But of course, this formula doesn't necessarily give you a probability. Why? Yeah, the actual values are lower than one, but you can't assure that the if you add them all together that you will get an equal value equal to one. So it's not a probability, of course. If you add probabilities together, you get one. So it's in the definition. So to circumvent that, we have to scale them of this factor, which is simply sum over them. Okay. So far, not enough, nothing new. Uh, which gives you a workable approach, of course, but it also creates a problem because this sum is not something you can easily paralyze. So, uh, if you you need to know the sum for every specific um, for every specific particle and for every specific um, rate, and you need to store the sum or calculate it somewhere. And the second problem which is a little bit less current, this approach actually assumes equal weight of microparticles. Of course, uh, in essence, what you're doing is you're throwing your dice for uh, one specific weight. And this formula doesn't account for the differences of the weight between particles. You could account for them, but then you would have to actually uh, get a histogram of the different weights of the particle inside yourself. And that's also not really a good idea, at least from a computational point of view. So, good idea, but doesn't seem to work, or at least doesn't fulfill everything we want. How is there another idea? Um, if you read the title, there stands algorithm A. It stands to reason that maybe there's also an algorithm B. And. Uh, an algorithm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's just a description of why it's not feasible. In essence, it comes down to um, either we have to store this, uh, that takes quite a lot of memory because we have to store it for every single worker, and we have quite a lot of them, or we have to calculate each, each time. And since there are 10 to 4 different rates, we would have to, in 10 to 6 microparticles, we would each time have to calculate that, and that's get large number, not a good idea. Um, so, in essence, it is feasible, but not really desirable. So, the idea B is, okay, the idea is of simply using some sort of scaled uh, rate with, or simply use rate as some sort of probability is good, but it doesn't give you a real probability. And instead, what we can do is we can simply um, interpret it as a probability so long as it's lower than one um, and uh, in essence allow our code to do a path through different intermediary states to some sort of final state. So in essence it's a version of a Markov chain. Um, so the basic idea is we take one specific microparticle with an initial uh, state and we randomly decide an intermediate state uh, from the dice, whether we actually change into the specific state, and throwing the dice, um, in, in essence, requires time, and you have a limited amount of time, exactly equal to one data TP, and each time you actually change to one specific state, you lose one, lose the corresponding time based on the rate of change from your current state to your next state. And if no time remains, okay, you're done for this particle, and you have, uh, in essence, completed your Markov chain. Um, that's the actual implementation. So, um, in principle, you start with the complete pick step available as your time. You choose one new state, um, and then we essentially, for this new state, calculate, okay, what's our specific um, quasi probability for this uh, change. And if this is larger than one, okay, it's at least likely that every particle does at least one of those state changes in, um, in our time step. So, okay, we do the state change, do exactly one of them, 
and uh, subtract the corresponding time for doing one of those time steps for our remaining time and carry on. Uh, if it's not larger than one, okay, we have an actual probability and we can simply uh, throw dice where we change into this new state and if the answer is yes, okay, then we're also done. If no, then okay, we continue and try the next intermediary state. So in essence, what this does is it re replicates how in a real physical plasma an ion would have the ability to do set, uh, to undergo several state changes over a specific time interval, or even only a partial time state, and that's represented by this sort of acceptance uh, probability. And in essence, the only thing we require for each of these steps is the weight between and the main time, so we don't need as much memory as we did before. Uh, the state also, of course, doesn't require equal weight macroparticles. Of course, the distribution is actually resolved on each specific uh, macroparticle level, and therefore it's feasible, both computational, physically, and from a memory standpoint, point of view. Okay, so that's one weight equation solver we can use. Um, but what still remains is, of course, how we calculate those weights we need. Um, so, in principle, weights can be divided in two different subcategories. The first ones are spontaneous ones. Those simply happen without an outside interference. And, of course, interaction-based ones. And those can, of course, be further divided in radiative interactive and collisional radiative interactive. But, in principle, they are quite equal. The spontaneous rates are mostly determined by our actual atomic structure and you can find them in large volumes which describe the rates of change between different states. And they are also mostly constant with time, so you can simply provide them as table to your code and have them already included. For the radiative and collisional ones, you need a cross-section and that's also something that can be provided in tables or there are even some uh, solutions which provide you the actual values as on-the-fly calculations, some at least approximative values. And the second thing you need, which is a little bit more complicated, are interaction partner densities, or at least um, interaction density. So how often does your ion actually interact with uh, electrons or photons? Um, and in the specific case we are looking at, in essence, you can simply describe the um, rates as integral of energy um, with either the uh, electron density for a specific uh, energy or the specific intensity, the spectral specific intensity uh, of your photon field. Um, the cross section are, as I said, already not really a problem because those can be um, calculated even on the fly to good enough formulas or approximation formulas um, that will be done by flyline, which I will cover later. Uh, a short question. Did you mean with cross sections the classical ones? Yeah, that okay, one okay. are actually classical sections, yes. Okay, good. Okay. Um, and which, in essence, remain, um, leaves us with the um, distribution functions for our electrons. Those can be are available, in essence, by our pick electrons. And the specific intensity. Specific intensity is a little bit problematic from a pick point of view, because pick doesn't include specific intensities. Pick includes field values, but they are not spectral resolved. And you don't want to do um, a, Fourier, a Fourier transformation for every single time stack for every cell. And furthermore, you would need some sort of local Fourier transformation, so <laughs> difficult. And uh, secondly, um, you could, in principle, do something like that using uh, uh, photon particles in PIG. Uh, 
which is, for example, done if you want to model Bremsstrahlung. But you then run into the problem that, that those photon particles work well if you're using uh, X-ray spectra, but they don't work well if you use infrared spectra, which are those spectra that's most important for actual atomic physics, and have a laser which has a driving field in the same region. So, in essence, if you do that, you would have uh, separate photons, which part of some photons which can actually interact with your ions, because they are big photons, and some photons which can't, because they are laser photons, and that's not really physical. So, it can be done if you um, limit yourself, at least in the basic understanding I have right now, if you limit yourself to X-rays, which probably will also already give you something you can work with. But for optical photons, it gets a little complicated if you use a laser, which is driving in optical spectrum. Yeah, the, the atomic interaction, which is in such a way that you're not driving a transistor. Because the optical lasers are usually really in the infrared, so driving a transition is rather hard because they are a, diff a different uh, wavelengths actually, in most cases. Unless you have something like a uh, change between two different um, uh, angular momentum states. Doesn't matter usually. Hmm? Doesn't matter much. Okay. Little, little, little effect overall. But nevertheless, um, I just, um, the uh, Radiation-based collision rates are something I thought about, but decided was a little bit off of scope of my master thesis. Yeah, <laughs> something to be <laughs> later included. <laughs> um, yes. Could you remind me where your internal atomic structure comes into play here? Uh, in essence, in the um, cross sections and in the. Um, so, in essence, you have a cross section for one specific. Um, uh, for changing from one specific state to another specific state. And uh, first of all, the state, of course, of the uh, state you want to change into must be free, and otherwise you can't change it. And secondly, you, of course, uh, have, uh, depending on how many ions you have, which are actually in, the, in a, a given starting state, also changes how you behave. And uh, of course, cross sections are dependent on between which specific states you change. Um, another question. Uh, is it possible to involve multi photon excitations of the. In principle, yes. And where, what, what, uh, so you, what do you need to do to. Uh, uh, in principle, what you simply would do is you would create for each, you would have uh, more, so each, num each photon which takes part in interaction is one of those specific intensities. So if you include more of them, you can of course include an arbitrary order photon interaction. Problem is just, you have to remember, you also need to have enough photons to actually represent your interactions. So if you have just five photons in your pick simulation, in your cell or in your supercell. You want to mean it's the interaction with a laser and there are enough photons in it. Yeah. There's a, <laughs> there, is now a lot of physics helping us. Um, the interaction with a laser that has really many, 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 many photons can be modeled in a different way and usually happens if all the other radiative parts don't play a role because this is happening where the laser is, that is happening in the infrared. And a high density plasma is usually opaque for these lasers. So it's not really happening. It's just happening at the boundaries and there it gets a bit complicated, I agree, but not very much for the overall result actually. So where there's almost no plasma and much of it is free space. So like in a gas, you model the multi-photon interaction in a much different way than we are talking here now and in a, in a much less expensive way. While in a high density, high energy plasma, in a real solid, much of the elect electric field that travels must travel at really high frequencies in order to 
get through that plasma, otherwise it stops almost immediately again. So no photons of, of small uh, frequency actually make it very far. So the idea, the only thing that travels there is something in the X-rays. This gives us at least a hand-waving argument where we can make a distinction between the really high multi-photon regime of direct interaction with the laser, because that's just not happening in that block of matter, it's outside, while everything that is happening in that block of matter is mostly X-rays. Of course, that's a total lie. There's spectrum. But hey, that's physics, you know, you just do the best you can up until now and then you, you finish your master and then the PhD thesis is to, to get it right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to stop somewhere and this is by this is right now, so to say, the approach and your approach is very sensible by basically saying, okay, forget radiative stuff right now and, and just go with what we have and then, then look at the next stuff. It's a very sensible approach. Yeah. Another question. So on, did you, so you neglect the change of the atomic structure due to na the neighbor, neighborhood yeah. environment. Yeah. Is that on purpose or because in certain regimes it doesn't matter? Um, I wouldn't say it doesn't matter, but it's more a time issue. Mm -hmm. um, time issue for, for you or for the code? <laughs> <laughs> uh, in principle, you, so it also becomes a computational problem if your atomic model gets very complicated. So in essence, since you correctly want to model it, you can spend the time you would normally spend for your peak simulation just modeling the influence of your peak simulation of your outside plasma on an atom. If you really want to do it up in ETH. If you don't want to do it, you can of course use more complicated models, but currently that's not implemented. I'm more I was saying this to point that things were keeping your simple analytical structure for the functional atoms, but adding a global field that will kind of add into account. That's something that would break your pick algorithm? Or? Not in principle, so uh, if I understand you correctly, it's, you would do something like, okay, um, we have um, maybe an additional way to change our atomic state based on the actual um, and on some some sort of field. Yeah. Like for example, the current implementation of field ionization, which was included in the contribute, which is we can add arbitrary fields on the grid. Okay. To store that information. Okay. But there are subtleties. Mm -hmm. One of, the, one of the biggest subtleties is, of course, the local uh, field distribution due to actual Coulomb field. Yeah. And that is not sampled. No, really. Because our macroparticles are not real particles. And also our... And this is very poorly sampled, and unfortunately the Coulomb field is a non-linear field. So if you f sample any distribution of real particles very poorly, and each of these produces a highly nonlinear field. If you're not doing this by the actual particles, you just suck in resolution and don't get anything out of it. So the better thing you do is actually create something like an average model and live with it. We don't have structure in PIC. We don't have a lattice in PIC. We don't have any of that in PIC. You can argue that you don't have any of that in a fluid simulation either, but there you go via an equation of state, which you don't have in this case. So it's... We're somewhere in between. We have much more highly granular information available, but just not enough. <laughs> <laughs> and you also remember that uh, the particle pushes 
which you use for the actual movement of particles, they don't necessarily correctly represent the actual trajectory on the scale of a cell. Yeah. They, for example, the uh, Boros push up, which is used in going to view currently, uh, simply does okay, half your, half your step for E field, one complete step for B field, half a step for E field. That isn't a circle. And if you expect a circle, so it might be if the circle is large enough, but, but if your circle radius is somewhere in the neighborhood of an actual cell size, then it will correctly represent the it will preserve energy, that's at least good, but or at least some of it. It's not the actual trajectory. But there are of course ideas how to do that. Okay. Yeah. There are even currently implement, uh, better implementations which I've worked on for particle pushers, but for different uh, characteristics. Okay. Um, yes, okay. Um, so, the cross sections will come later. What this remains is how we want to actually create this histogram. Um, and the problem we have is that we don't actually know the uh, electron distribution. Of course, we have to somehow bin those electrons into a histogram to get the distribution. And we, of course, don't want to do that twice. Um, the second problem is that in this formula, there's a relative velocity. For one ion, I can tell you the velocity, no problem. But if you give me a distribution of electrons, getting there, getting not only the energy distribution, but also the velocity, velocity uh, direction distribution, gets a little bit more complicated. So in essence, you get a um, four or at least three dimensional histogram if you're a little bit more intelligent. And filling this histogram with a good enough resolution and still enough particles so that you at least cover most of the bins becomes problematic because even though we have quite a lot of electrons, we don't have that many to actually fill something which is uh, 128 by 128, uh, 128 order of three different bins and each of them should have maybe two or three at least. Uh, yeah, that's, that's going to get difficult. Uh, so to avoid that, the, the standard way is to simply say, okay, uh, ions are, tend to be much slower than our electrons. So we simply say, okay, relative velocity is electron velocity. And since we are not actually interested in the direction, but just in the actual absolute value, that means our velocity gets, becomes simply a function of energy and we can simply use in one dimensional histogram. So far, so good. Next problem we have is this integral doesn't have a positive energy cutoff. And in principle, it's not easy to construct a cutoff. Of course, you can have widely differing uh, energies of those electrons from kV to uh, MeV. Beta equals 0.1. Hmm? Beta equals 0.1. That was easy. Yes, but we also want to do. Um, we want to actually get a good enough resolution for this complete size without using very many bins, or at least not more than we actually need to do. So a simple fixed bin size to some sort of given maximum energy is not a good idea because if you use enough of those bins to actually cover up to one tenth of your speed of light, that's quite a lot of bins. And if you say, okay, I'm reducing my bin size, you're also reducing the energy resolution, which is also not a good idea if you actually want to do a spectroscopics or at least something that resembles spectroscopics later. So what do we do? Yeah, the idea is to use some sort of adaptive histogram, which doesn't have a fixed bin size, but decides the bin size um, due to at least somewhat intelligent. Okay, what does intelligently mean? So in principle, what the idea I have, I'm implementing is that we um, decide the bin size such that the uh, error we expect for our rates is, or at least the relative error of those rates is below a certain constant given by a user. 
That means that the user has installed at least somewhat an idea of what he does if he reduces or increases this number, and it also gives you at least some error approximation. Okay, now, of course, that's a good idea. The problem now becomes how do we actually calculate this error of our world? Of course, yeah, maybe, maybe not, but it's definitely not something that jumps to my mind. And in principle, the idea I'm following is I'm expanding the integral in a Taylor series uh, up to the zeroth order for our actual electron distribution because we don't actually have this specific value and to uh, an arbitrary order for the rest. Um, then, due to the way we expanded our integral, we can actually separate the integral into two factors. The first one being our um, electron distribution, and the second one being everything else. And then we simply say, okay, this factor is a measure of our relative error. At least higher orders of this factor are a measure of our relative error. And that's what I'm in essence using. Um, of course, since in this second factor there are derivatives of both the velocity and your um, cross-section, we need to know both of them. And for the velocity, it's easy because it's a function you can analytically derive up to whatever order you want. That's something you can directly put into your, into your simulation. But for the cross-section, it's a little bit more complicated simply because the cross-sections we are using are uh, empirical fits to data. And those empirical fits is nothing I would want to hard code into my simulation. And therefore, we will have to do this numerically. And I specifically using a paper from, from Ben Kornberger from 1988 which um, gives you a relatively easy um, algorithm to get the um, coefficients for finite difference of arbitrary order on whatever spacing of um, specific x values you have. And that allows you to get a quite dynamic way to actually calculate those derivatives if you can evaluate them. Um, and in my specific case, I'm just using it to calculate the error of this um, for a given bin width and then uh, change the bin width until we reach the uh, upper limit of our, the user has provided and therefore get the maximum bin width for a given uh, accuracy. And that allows us to save memory because we have at least in principle. And the second trick we're using is we don't use a histogram of a fi fixed number of bins but instead uh, use a simple double linked list and add additional um, bits. And of course, the histogram is also also includes this. Um, it allows for bits to be empty. Empty bits are not actually in the list. They're not safe because they don't contain information, at least from our point of view. Yeah. Um, that in essence, is what I have at least termed an adaptive histogram. Um, what remains is, of course, the cross-section uh, calculation. In a specific case, I'm reusing a prototype which was written by Axel Rubel. And this prototype, in essence, does takes the formulas out of the flight check uh, existing uh, atomic physics and plasma simulation, it uses the same basic atomic data sets, uh, the same approximations, the same empirical formulas. Uh, he simply converted them into Python to make them more accessible. And I'm going using them via, uh, currently via PyBind module, which allows me to query them from C++ code. Um, that has the major advantage that we can easily check our code against FlyCheck because both of them use the same uh, basic atomic physics assumptions. So if the part I actually implemented is correct, they should at least give comparable results. But of course, in the future, the idea is that we actually implement something like this directly in Bitcoin GP. Okay. Um, last thing I just want to mention is, of course, um, we have talked about the parts um, like how we store states, 
how we update the states, how we get the rates for that. But what, of course, um, I haven't talked about yet is how the back feed, the feedback from our uh, state of uh, changing atomic states to our electron population works. And the reason for that is not that I haven't thought about that, I have some basic ideas and I even implemented them already, but they are basically quite uninteresting. But because what they essentially do is okay, we can remember how much energy in a specific energy bin was consumed by our atomic state transitions, and then simply reiterate over all our electrons and simply. Um, distribute this energy change over all electrons proportional to the rate. So that's a basic model, but one that would probably be sufficient for now. And um, that is the end of my talk. Uh, feel free to ask any remaining questions or whatever you want to do.